Hello. This lecture is about economic policy, or more specifically, kind of a basic introduction to economic principles. Since I realize this is a sort of introductory level political science class, I'm going to assume that most of you haven't had a chance to take econ courses before, and so may not sort of know what all these terms mean. Rather than go through sort of point by point everything that's going on in the book, therefore, I wanted to set aside one lecture to sort of use a very sort of every, what I think is a somewhat everyday example to show how economic principles work in our daily life. Um, the example I've chosen for a variety of reasons are sort of is sort of med the medical field. And part of what I want to do is at the very end of this talk a little bit about what's been known as Obamacare or the Affordable Health uh, Care Act. Not necessarily to promote it or not to promote it, but at least to take a look at how you can use uh, some of the economic principles that we talk about in the book and elsewhere to understand what's going on with Obamacare. I'm not going to go into the details and I'm going to try very hard to be nonpartisan when I sort of talk about it. But it is a huge issue in our society today, and so it might be helpful to sort of talk through a little bit. Before I get too far into that, though, I want to talk about the basic principles of what's known as free market economics. Um, free market economics, interestingly enough, is what most economists use as sort of their ground, ground or baseline. They assume that the American system is based largely on principles of free market economics. We'll talk in the next lecture a little bit about to what extent that is or is not true. But let's get down to sort of an understanding of what that means. Free market economics or laissez-faire economics um, were best described over 200, almost 300 years ago by a man named Adam Smith. And he basically argued, and he argued in a time when basically most governments, which were of course royal European governments, interfered heavily in the market. And he wrote a book called The Invisible Hand, which basically argued that if governments would just get out of the market and get out of sort of the practice of economics altogether, or as much as possible, the system would regulate itself and come up with a system in which everyone acting in their own self-interest will create a system that is the most efficient possible. And it's helpful before we get too far into it to remember that when he's talking about efficient, he means that as many people as possible use as few resources as possible in getting what it is that they need. Um, Efficient you doesn't necessarily mean that everyone gets what they need, and that's one very important caveat. It means that as many people as possible use as few resources as possible to get things. Let's start with a very basic example. Um, let's talk about, you know, assume I have a headache, grading too many papers or staring at computer screens too late at night, and I decide I want an aspirin so I to cure my headache. I head down to the local store and I discover that I can get a bottle of Bayer aspirin for three dollars, say. And this is the market price for aspirin. Um, now, and that was Bayer aspirin. Suppose a new company comes into the market and they decide that they want to also sell aspirin. Well, they're going to have a hard time competing against Bayer because Bayer is, of course, a known brand that's been around for over 100 years. But one way that they might be able to create, to, to compete against Bayer, is to charge less money. So the new company, unknown company, starts selling aspirin for $2.50 a bottle, where Bayer is still charging $3 a bottle. If I go to the store at this point, I'll now have a choice. I can choose to buy the Bayer aspirin, which will cost a little bit more, or I could buy the unknown brand of aspirin, which will cost a little bit less. I now have the opportunity to decide how I want to spend my money. Is it more important to me to have the reliable brand and pay more? Is it more important to me to save a little bit money and so I'll buy from this unknown brand? The result of this, however, 
is that we now have more products and more cheap, uh, these products are available more cheaply. Um, the competition allows me to get my aspirin more cheaply than if a monopoly had existed. If Bayer was the only aspirin game in town, I would have been forced to pay $3. Now I have the option to pay $2.50. Eventually, as time wears on, if enough people decide to buy the cheaper aspirin, Bayer may lose enough business that they have to make a few tough decisions. If they want to stay in the market, they may choose to lower their price to more effectively keep uh, compete with the other company. So they may cho choose to charge, say, 250 or maybe 260 for their aspirin. In that case, that benefits me because now. There is, I don't even have the option of paying $3 for aspirin. I can get better aspirin for $260 or unknown aspirin for $250. I, this is an efficiency in the market. I can now buy more aspirin more cheaply than I could before. Bayer's other option, of course, is to develop new products. And if you've looked at the aspirin aisle of your local drugstore recently, you see that there are, in fact, lots of different kinds of aspirin out there. Um, they have now marketed aspirin for older women, which has calcium in it. They've marketed baby aspirin, which tastes like oranges or cherries or whatever. They've created aspirin for people who are on heart therapy. All of these different products are now ways in which Bayer and other aspirin companies are trying to compete with each other to offer different products at different prices to try to lure people and to stay competitive. It's important to realize that Bayer and other companies don't necessarily do this because they care about children or care about the elderly or women. They're doing all of this because they want to seek a pro they're seeking a profit and so they're trying to find ways in which they can make their product more appealing to more people who will then buy and spend money and make profit. That's the free market at work. It's worth noting that Writing 300 years ago, even Adam Smith saw that there were things that would not be efficiently provided by the market. That market competition was very good for doing for talking about consumer goods like aspirin, like clothes, like food, but that there were things that could not be efficiently provided by the market. Um, Generally, these are things that have huge startup or distribution costs, which would not be effectively recouped from customers. The usual example is something like water. If you think about it, you know, the, the amount of cost and effort it takes to put in an entire plumbing system, getting, you know, a water main up and, well, starting with getting an aquifer up and a water purification plant and a water main and everything else and, you know, taking that water all the way out to the countryside. Um, and it's not like you can charge hundreds of dollars for a gallon of water because if you did that, well, people would find cheaper water elsewhere or just, you know, get a huge barrel out and start collecting water. Um, so Adam Smith said something like that might be an example of, of an industry or an item which would not be efficiently provided by the market, in which, in which case he sort of actually tacitly understood that there would be a, probably a monopoly perhaps that needed to be regulated by the government to provide this. Um, since I'm using mostly medical examples, I'll think of something like nine, enhanced 911 service. Um, 911 service, as many of you may know, has a huge network nowadays of computer systems, integration with cell phone towers, etc. So that if you are, say, driving down a highway and you don't know where you are, but you, you know, have an emergency, you can pick up your cell phone and call 911 and they can figure out where you are and how to send a first responder there. Um, that also means that you're paying for some a human being to sit at the monitor 24-7-365 in anticipation of your call. Um, it's very difficult to charge people who use that service. Um, think about it. I mean, not only are you dealing with, you know, something that, you know, someone who is very fortunate may never use in their lifetime, but somebody who's just perpetually accident prone may use regularly. Well, that's one challenge, but you're also providing a service which can be used by almost anyone. So a trucker from out of state still has access to the enhanced 911 service as does, you know, and needs to, in fact, um, because you never know who's going to spot the accident. Um, 
this is something that would be very difficult to recoup from consumers, the enhanced 911 service. So this one might be a situation in which, uh, you know, a regulated monopoly might be necessary. You could also argue that other th another thing that might not be efficiently provided by the market are some areas which sort of benefit society and should be provided, even though the market might not provide a, the best way of doing so. Um, I would argue that basic education falls into this category. That all of society benefits when people have a minimum level of literacy. Why? Well, okay, not only because it means that we've got a better pool of people to go to nursing school and medical school and so on and make good medical decisions, but it also keeps people from making poor decisions because, for example, they can't read enough to understand the warning labels on a bottle of aspirin or something like that. Um, these are This is a benefit to society. It prevents poisonings and all kinds of other things. And therefore, I would argue that this is something that, you know, should probably be more efficiently given to everybody rather than just to the people who pay, can pay for it. And before you think I'm completely off my rocker, let's not forget that when Adam Smith was writing, very few people could uh, were actually literate because all schools were effectively either private schools or private tutors. So most people did not have a lot of education. Um, as we are an increasingly literate society, this is something that we actually need to survive. So I've talked a little bit about sort of what Adam Smith sort of thought about how a free market should work, and the fact that he himself recognized that free markets would not always work to provide all goods most efficiently. What I want to do now is talk a little bit about some of the challenges that come with completely unregulated markets and what people have done about them. The first challenge that comes with a completely unregulated market is that occasionally you'll have people who can try to take advantage of the system. Um, using medical examples, you know, we talked about sort of aspirins. Well, there's really, in a completely unregulated market, there is nothing keeping me from taking, going out, buying a box of, of chalkboard chalk, um, getting a saw or something to cut all these little pieces of chalk into little slivers that look kind of like pills, putting those pills into bottles, claiming their aspirin and charging two dollars a bottle. I would make a fortune. This would be a brilliant idea because it's I'm offering people aspirin at cheaper than the market rate. And I'm, you know, not I don't have a whole lot of overhead in this. People would buy this. It wouldn't be aspirin. Um, and again, before you think I'm completely off my rocker, this is the type of thing that people did in the early 20th century. Um, there was, I can tell you horror stories about this, um, I won't. But this is part of what led to the implementation of, for example, of the Food and Drug Administration, which regulates this type of transaction and actually does engage in rigorous testing to make sure that if I sell something that's claiming to be a, a drug or a food product, it actually is what I say it is and not you know, chalk. Your book calls this economic equity, the idea that people are getting what they think they are paying for. If someone is paying $2 for a bottle of aspirin, econo economic equity demands that they are actually buying a bottle of aspirin and not a bottle of chalk. So this is the first sort of challenge of free market, of completely free markets, and this is the first, you know, thing that people have tried to do to sort of limit uh, completely free markets in the interest of trying to protect people or allow the system to work better. Another challenge in completely free economic, uh, free market economies is that there are some advantages to people trying to corner the market. Um, go back to my original example of Bayer aspirin. If nobody had ever created a cheaper aspirin, there would be no competition. And that would leave Bayer to effectively charge almost anything they wanted. I mean, obviously, they couldn't charge $100 for a bottle of aspirin because then nobody would ever buy aspirin and people would just suffer with really bad headaches. But within reason, they could charge whatever they wanted. Um, now, fortunately, aspirin is something that is apparently relatively cheap to produce, which is why we have a number of different brands and types of aspirin. 
But for other items, government sometimes steps in to ensure that markets are competitive. Um, those of you who pay attention to uh, the city of Pittsburgh and things that are going on in the newspapers of the city of Pittsburgh, there's a very real example that was brewing not too long ago. Um, it turns out that uh, University of Pittsburgh uh, has sort of consolidated most of the hospitals in the city of Pittsburgh. Uh, they've now created something called UPMC, which is the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center, and bought up almost all of the hospitals in Pittsburgh. They've also um, created sort of a health insurance plan. And it should surprise you not at all that the way they've structured their health insurance plan makes it substantially more expensive to go to rival hospitals. Um, Allegheny General, for example, is not within UPMC's medical system. And it's much more expensive for people with UPMC medical insurance to go to Allegheny General Hospital. Um, People have looked at this system and wondered if perhaps um, the University of Pittsburgh was creating an unfair monopoly and using their clout in providing medical services to edge out other health insurance providers. Because since so many, um, and, and vice versa, since so many people were UPMC, they could basically make it very hard for people who were members of UPMC to go to other hospitals, that then increases their ability to sort of um, raise fees and it, uh, also increases their ability to sort of keep their own hospitals running. Um, this is something that is very hotly debated and in fact at the state legislature people were ta taking a look at what they could do to sort of prevent this kind of unfair competition from happening. Um, that's still being worked out by the way, so I don't have a resolution for that one for you all. Um, the third way in which, uh, in which free market econ economies can sometimes work to people's disadvantages and ways that governments have sought to intervene in that is that sometimes people can take too much advantage of uh, things that seem to be free but that actually shift the burden of cost onto other people. So in a medical example, think of something like medical waste. Um, and this can be almost anything from, you know, leftover prescriptions sitting in one's medical, uh, in one's medicine cabinet to, you know, the very real problem encountered by hospitals of what do you do with soiled bandages and soil and old syringes and stuff like that. The very natural and cheap solution is to dump all of this stuff into the regular trash. Um, that has a huge cost to it. Uh, back in the early 90s, there was a regular problem when people kept discovering things like medical west waste washing up on beaches because it had sort of been carried out to, to sea. Um, and beaches would have to be shut down because they would be contaminated by all kinds of germs and horrible, horrible diseases that had been in this medical waste. Um, sharp objects dropped into the ordinary trash system can stick other people and infect them with bloodborne diseases, people get sick or worse. Um, this is actually what's known as an externality. Uh, your book defines this as a cost that someone other than the producer would pay. So the cost of being a hospital or something like that is that you have all these used bandages and used syringes and things. You know, you would like it it would cost you more to do something special with them. It costs you absolutely, well, it costs you nothing more than sort of trash hauling fees to dump them in the trash. But the cost of someone who act to someone who accidentally gets stick, stuck with the syringe is not something that the hospital has to pay, something that the person who accidentally got stuck has to pay. Um, the government solves this problem by regulating medical waste and requiring separate and safe disposal, which is more expensive. Um, this is government regulation of externalities. So far, I've been talking about very concrete things like aspirins and waste. Um, and I've been doing that on purpose to try to give you sort of very concrete examples of complex terms. Um, I stop now and sort of say, well, hopefully you've understood, as I've been talking about this, how the basics of free markets, efficiency, equity, monopoly, externalities, how all of that stuff applies in our very day-to-day -day world. Um, 
I sort of want to stop there and sort of, or at least pause there and sort of make sure that everyone understands that. If not, go back and review. Because we're going to go into something that's a lot more complex now. Um, free market econ economics was fairly easy to understand in, you know, the 1700s because most of the things that people dealt with were actual tangible items and commodities. Um, I can hold an aspirin in my hand and I can, if someone says they're going to charge me $3 for, for a hundred aspirin, I can sit there and count whether or not I have 300, uh, whether I have a hundred aspirin or not. And I can run a medical test on it to see whether or not, you know, it, it actually is aspirin. Um, much of our eco modern economy, however, is driven by things that are harder to hold or examine. Things like credit and insurance. And so while I can touch an aspirin and test an aspirin and see whether it's an aspirin, it's much harder to see, you know, whether I'm insured. It's much harder to see whether something is worth credit. It's much harder to see something like risk. Um, and yet, so much of our economy is based on that now. And in particular, if we want to talk about something like Obamacare, which is what I want, what I'm moving into, um, it's helpful to understand how free market is supposed to work um, when talking about tangible things before we talk about the intangibles of Obamacare. So let's talk a little bit about what's going into Obamacare. Um, it starts by helping to understand what insurance is. And on some level, all types of insurance are basically the same, whether you're talking about health insurance, car insurance, life insurance, whatever. Um, there is an old joke that, you know, insurance is basically money you pay into a company in the hopes that you will never have to use it. Um, my guess is most of you are a minimum familiar with sort of car insurance because the state of Pennsylvania, where most of us, I'm guessing, live, mandates it. Uh, every couple of months, I pay my car insurance. The idea is that that way, if I ever got into a crash, um, there would be my car insurance company would pay me for the cost of repairing my car, would pay me for, you know, if I got into an accident and I got hurt, would pay my medical bills. If, heaven forbid, I actually hurt somebody else, it would pay their medical bills and so on. But I've been insured with the same company for good grief over 10 years now, and I've never, ever had to file a car insurance claim, and I should say, you know, do something like knock wood right now to, in the hopes that I never have to do it again. Uh, the car insurance company has made thousands of dollars off of me because they've never had to pay a claim. Uh, but the way it works is that I pay, you know, a certain amount of money. My neighbor pays a certain amount of money to the car insurance company. Someone else pays a certain amount of money to the car insurance company. And the car insurance company pools all of this money together and then when one of us gets into an accident or, you know, has a windshield chip or something like that, they send some of that money that all of us have pooled to that person who has filed a claim. Um, this is why insurance exists, because in the grand scheme of things, if you get into a really bad car accident or whatever, the actual bill will be huge and will be much more expensive if you've priced out the price of even a used car nowadays. A used car is way more, costs way more money than most people have on hand. It's much easier to sort of keep paying for it in little installments through insurance than it is to have to pay the entire bill of a used car up front if you need one on short notice. But this very problem of sort of, you know, like I said, the joke, insurance is, you know, money you pay to someone in the hopes that you will never have to use it, is why a lot of people sort of say, well, I choose not to buy it. Um, as I said, I'm sort of an interesting example. I've had car insurance with the same company for 10 years now. Thus far, I've not had an accident. You know, I might look at these things and sort of rationally decide, well, you know what, that might mean that I'm a fairly safe driver. Maybe I don't need insurance. Um, you know, I can certainly think of things I would rather be doing with those couple hundred bucks every couple months. Um, why would I, why should I buy it? Well, the easy answer to that in this case is that the state of Pennsylvania mandates it. Um, and the state of Pennsylvania mandates it. Um, because, well, because of externalities. 
Remember, externality is a cost uh, that is shifted onto somebody else. Uh, so, if an uninsured driver causes a crash, you know, well, let's do the worst case scenario. I am driving around with, without car insurance, and if I crash into you, your car might be damaged. You might, you know, break an arm or worse and wind up in the hospital. If I have no insurance, um, or if even worse, I run, I drive away without, you know, exchanging information or whatever, you're going to be stuck with the car bill, the hospital bill, and everything else. That's an externality. The cost of my action has now gone on to you. Um, state of Pennsylvania and many other states require car insurance for all drivers based on the idea that this will limit that externality. Um, the other thing that's worth noting before we get too far into the Obamacare discussion is that insurance companies really aren't stupid. Um, they have different levels of coverage based on the likelihood that someone will make a claim. And sometimes they would choose not to insure people what's at all. Um, they have very elaborate sort of tables in which they sort of figure out who is more likely to have a claim and who isn't. The people who are least likely to have a claim usually have le pay less into the system. Uh, the people who have a couple of accidents on their record are already have to pay for a lot of insurance. Um, the same principle basically applies for health care as well. Um, and that into, uh, extends to the, the difficulty with externalities for a start. Um, if somebody lands in the emergency room and doesn't have health insurance, um, and the hospital doesn't discover this uh, until later, or maybe the hospital, for whatever reason, uh, this person falls into a category where they have to provide care. Um, doctors have, you know, doctors and nurses have the Hippocratic Oath. They're not; they can't stand by and let pe someone die if they can prevent it. Um, so, if someone comes into an ER having a heart attack or something like that. The hospital goes and provides care, and then discovers after the fact that the person can't afford to pay. Well, this is an externality. The hospital has expended a large amount of resources to save in saving this person's life, um, and they now have to absorb that cost. Well, hospital. This usually means that hospitals have to. This goes into the bottom line of hospitals and makes all hospital cares more expensive. Um, the other thing that sort of feeds this debate is that people with chronic dis conditions like asthma or diabetes. Um, often can avoid trips to the emergency room if they follow a very good uh, uh, schema of taking medications and doing proper care. But that taking those medications and following up on that care and visiting doctors and so on also costs money. Again, if people can't afford that or don't have the health insurance, they wind up having emergency trips to the uh, emergency room which costs more money than the initial care, but because it's in the emergency room, the hospital observes that cost, which then gets passed on. How does that get passed on? Well, suddenly, going to the, being a hospital has gotten more expensive, and so the average trip to the hospital has gotten more expensive for everyone. Um, this is also the case where, as I said earlier, insurance companies aren't stupid, they can figure out that the average, you know, 21 year old who has no chronic medical conditions whatsoever and doesn't have a penchant for playing really risky sports like football, um, and for that matter, doesn't smoke and isn't overweight, that person is going to cost an insurance company a lot less money than somebody who is, say, 54, has been smoking for 20 years, and, you know, has has some other conditions. Um, one of those, the 20 year old therefore will have much cheaper insurance than the 54 year old. The 54 year old might discover that he or she can't afford insurance, whereas the 20 year old might sort of say, well I'm healthy, why would I want it? Now you've got sort of externalities on all sides. This was a challenge because, well, for a number of reasons. Um, but one of the challenges became that there were allegations I personally have known at least one person who wound up sort of 
paying, a, she was 20 years old and had undiagnosed asthma, actually no, had an undiagnosed heart condition, um, and wound up sort of being in hock for the first three or four years of her professional life to a hospital for treating this heart condition and having emergency heart surgery, but she didn't have insurance. Um, people started to notice that these were the scenarios that sort of caused a lot of problems, that people's, that a number of people were declaring personal bankruptcy based on medical issues and so on. Um, now, there's a fair amount of debate about whether this was a very small fraction of people or whether there were a lot of people in this situation. Like I said, I have one friend that I knew of who fell into this situation, but maybe, you know, I only have one friend, and quite honestly, I have a lot of friends, so maybe that's not the norm. Maybe it was the norm. Lots of pe This is something that people have argued about. However, for whatever reason, the Democratic Party decided that this was a problem that they saw as an emerging and growing po policy problem. Um, they believed that it was causing a drain on the economy that, for what, a lot of reasons. So they decided to try to address this problem. Well, there were a couple of ways that they could do it. The two big options that were out there, and there were a lot of smaller options that I'm not going to go into, but the first big option was to have a single-payer health care system. Um, those of you who are familiar with Medicare and Medicaid, or for that matter, those of you who've read ahead a little bit in the book and have read about Medicare and Medicaid, um, this is what Medicare and Medicaid are. The government is a single payer that pays the cost of all care for people on me in Medicare and Medicaid. Um, the f really fascinating thing is that Medicaid, which is the uh, program f of health insurance for the elderly, um, the government has pretty much a monopoly on that. There is no other health insurance program for the elderly. When you turn, when you turn 70, you or 65 rather, you will go on Medicare. It's not like you can keep your old insurance if you wanted to. You can't, um, which is a fascinating thing, which we will talk about in a minute. Um, the fact that the government has this monopoly on health care allows them to set prices um, so that the government can kind of dictate, well, what is the cost of a knee replacement for someone who's on Medicare or something like that. Um, the advantage of this system was, of course, everyone was covered, um, and it was a system in which sort of the government could regulate prices, the government could try to regulate quality, and so on. It is, in fact, socialism, and one of uh, it is, in fact, a more socialist system than many European countries, which are usually considered socialist. Why? Because there is a single provider of the of the health payment si system, and that single provider is the government. Because of this problem of sort of, well, because of the absence of competition, the government decided to go for a different option with regular health insurance, and that's forced competition. This is what Obamacare tries to set up with certain key sort of caveats and pitfalls. Um, the way it works is that it sets a federal law that says that by a certain time, everyone is forced to buy insurance. This is the much debated individual mandate. Um, the individual is you or I. The mandate is that we are mandated to buy insurance. Because everybody buys into the system, and it doesn't matter where we buy insurance, um, there will be under certain, uh, under this plan, there is at least one government insurance option, but you are also free to buy health insurance from whomever was willing to provide it for you. Um, and because everybody has health insurance, it minimizes externalities. There are no, hospitals will no longer have to absorb the costs of covering, um, of caring for the uninsured because presumably everyone will have insurance. Um, but because there is not a single payer, because there are different insurance companies competing for my insurance dollars, per, uh, in theory, uh, there's competition to make sure that the um, healthy people will be able to sort of go through and buy whatever insurance they want. And because insurers want healthy people, um, because healthy people will wind up being kind of like me in the car insurance example, they're the ones who wind up paying and who very rarely use the services, that covers the costs for the unhealthy people. Um, the government will regulate care, 
sort of to create a certain amount of equity in the system, make sure that all insurers are going to cover similar things. And government will also regulate to forbid the dropping of the sickest people, again, to mi minimize externalities. Right now, the way the system is set up, people who have chronic medical conditions um, find it very difficult, if not impossible, to get health insurance. Why? Because if you think of someone who has asthma, for example, and has to take pills on a daily basis to prevent going to the ER, well, those pills get covered, and so those pills wind up being very expensive, much more expensive than someone who's healthy. Um, because the government forbids dropping the sickest people, it minimizes externalities. But because those sick people are now in the insurance pool with everyone else, it makes the cost of insurance go up for everyone else, especially for healthy people, and also for insurers who now have to pay for all these pills that they would rather not pay for. That's Obamacare or the Affordable Health Care Act in a nutshell. Um, there's a lot more to it than that, but this is sort of using Obamacare to explain economic pol uh, the basics of economic policy. Um, there's two things to note before I wrap up my conversation about sort of Obamacare as it is, it's called. The first is that one of the things that is under consideration by the Supreme Court at the in the summer of 2012 is, is this question of the individual mandate. The question of whether the US government can force in individuals to buy insurance. And I point this out for, well, most significantly because of our earlier conversations about sort of civil rights and civil liberties. This is one of those situations where the things that seem to be perfectly reasonable and legal for states to do, the state of Pennsylvania can force us to buy car insurance, are not necessarily legal or reasonable for the federal government to do. The federal government cannot force us to buy insurance. States can. Um, the other thing that I'd like to note is sort of the, well, I personally always find it a little bit ironic when I see people, especially very older, much older people, people who are either on Social Security or close to it, complaining about socialism when it comes to health care. Um, because, of course, the irony, at least in my eyes, is that if they're old enough to qualify for Medicare, they are on a much more socialist system than Obamacare would, would try to set up. Um, basically, because the socialist system is that there is one payer and that payer is the government. That is the Medicare and Medicaid program. The system that Obamacare tries to set up has a minimum of competition. It just does not allow for the exclusion of everybody. So it's not entirely free a free market, but it's a slightly mod it's a freer market than the Medicare system would allow. I hope that this has been helpful to you. Um, if you have questions about the Met the Obamacare piece, please feel free to email me pri uh, privately. Um, but the main thing that I want you to get are these sort of key economic terms that we've been talking about. And so I'm hoping that that at least has been cleared up in the course of this lecture. Our next lecture will talk more about sort of the other, the ways in which the U.S. Uh, economic system turns out not to be as free a market as people think it is, which is why I want to sort of make sure that this lecture talked about what the free market was about. I'll look forward to talking to you at the next lecture. Have a good day.